design in business is actually a very important topic. Um, and the reason is because something happened in uh, around 2010, maybe 2013, 14. Um, and what happened is that um, the big technology companies, the big healthcare companies, the big um, you know, consumer retail brands across the, across the spectrum, including governments, uh, started to notice that the game has changed. And what is the change of the game? The, the change of the game is that the technologies that we use you know, from the big technology companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, you know, things like that, uh, that they are shaping our lives. They're changing how we interact. So our, our consumers, our patients, our citizens, they expect mobile, you know, experiences. They expect to be able to manage more of their life, for example, on mobile. Um, so it, what happened in business, though, is that businesses started to take design seriously before design was considered just like um, you know something to make it beautiful you know design is like at the end or you know some the the girl who paints pretty pictures or who draws pretty pictures is the way that one of our clients referred to the designer in the organization and it, it's if you think that that's what design is, the girl who paints pretty pictures, then you're missing the, the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years of what's happened in, in business. Um, because design is not just about pretty pictures. Of course, that's important. The, the aesthetics, the beauty is important. Uh, but what's more important is the experience. And um, the experience is a type of design that we call user experience design, right? Or UX design, user experience design. And user experience design has changed how we think about design because instead of doing market research, marketing, you know, to understand a product or instead of drawing the pretty pictures, with Photoshop or whatever. Um, instead of that, we are trying to now connect with the user, the consumer, the citizen, the patient. We're trying to connect with them at the experience level, at the behavior level. So we're trying to understand what do we need in the design to support their experience. And this whole uh, you know, awakening, if you will, of user experience design has changed how business is per perceiving design. So design has a very, very important role. In, in around 2010, 2012 or so, um, and certainly in the last five years, to be sure, uh, we've seen companies, uh, they hire a design chief, like a, a, a chief designer. And, that, and the job of that, that design head a little bit like the way Steve Jobs was the head of Apple is where is where people started to notice. So what is it about Apple that they make such, you know, not just beautiful products, but products that are easy to use? You know, they seem to work uh, mostly, you know. <laughs> um, what is it about Apple? Well, there's this guy, Steve Jobs, and he's saying, you know, be, you know pay attention to every single detail and focus on the experience and make it work and, and make it beautiful, you know. And then Jonathan Ives, of course, his second in command, and now that he's dead, and Jonathan Ives became the the the, the top guy. So people are saying, who's who's this this role, you know, that that you can give a designer the same power in your organization as the COO or the CMO or the CTO, you know, the C level. Uh, one of the one of the um, top ten jobs on LinkedIn this year in 2020 at least, is Chief Experience Officer, CXO. And the Chief Experience Officer is this kind of, of higher level, serious business, like design as serious business, because design can change how you develop the product, so it can affect your engineering direction. It can change your marketing because 
you understood from the consumers that there's a new trend. You know, for example, with the COVID, with coronavirus, uh, consumers are changing their behavior. They're changing their, you know, now they don't go to restaurants. So how can you deliver the food? How can you safely, how can you make it easy for them? Um, you know, just like in Greece, there was a major innovation during the coronavirus in the beginning when the government allowed the prescriptions to come by mobile in, instead of having old people going to the pharmakia. Um, that was a major innovation. It was just like somehow the government just saw like this innovation. And maybe because at that time, the Greek government was not um, fighting the coronavirus like the, the way they were in Italy. They didn't, you know, in Italy, they didn't have time to think about innovation. <laughs> they were so like, you know, catastrophe. But uh, it, things like that, like understanding like what's happening and in your market and in your environment, that's the business of design to understand the human, to understand the, uh, the values of the human, the behaviors, and to then bring that into your design process. First of all, with design, you have to take it seriously as a business tool, right? And you have to understand that it's not a tactical thing. Of course, it has tactical, you know, you create things, but it, it has much more power than that. Um, it has the power to to add value to to save your your organization money, you know, by by targeting the 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 um, uh, requirements to the user's behavior, and then you you save time in engineering. These things have been studied. You do wireframing, so you create like a draft, like a sketch, the way an architect does before you build the house. You save, you know, you know what you're building. You save time. You save money. Then when the product goes to the consumer or to the if it's business to business, if it goes to the the end user. They say, wow, this is exactly what I wanted. So this is amazing. And then you get user satisfaction, you get loyalty, you get customer retention. These are, this is money on the table. So first you have to understand the business value of design, the way many companies have, you know, and if you go to Silicon Valley today with a new company idea, the, the venture capitalists will, will ask you not, they used to ask you, where is your user experience design? Now they ask you, how good is your user experience design? And probably how great, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, with regard to um, uh, design outsourcing and how, you know, because uh, you can, you know, maybe you don't have the capabilities. Maybe you don't, maybe, you know, maybe you have a UX designer or, or a designer who, who is growing into a UX role right, or capacity, but you don't have a strong, you don't have this like, you know, Apple, uh, you know, Jonathan Ives kind of style of, of, and even Jonathan Ives has left Apple now, so he's consulting outside, but so when you look at the organization and you look at, so first we take it seriously business, but then we look at it as not just a department in, in, in the Istigonia, but we look at it as, um, as an organization-wide, uh, not initiative, but cultural change in the organization. All the, because at Apple, everybody is thinking about the, the customer. Everybody's thinking about the user, you know? Um, and it, it sort of looks like a religion, but most cultural changes look like a religion. You know, you have beliefs, you have practices, you have, um, uh, you know, uh, symbols, you know, we, we test with users, we hold the user up. That's, that's our, our, our truth that we get from, from the, from UX. Um, but if you don't, so, so how, to, you know, do it internally or outsource it, Just send the design out. There are problems with both sides. You know, um, I mean, I'm speaking to you as a consultant, so I run a UX consulting firm. Um, and I've worked internally, I've worked with different types of organizations, hundreds and hundreds of organizations globally. I've seen all the sides. The one thing about, so the question isn't, should we hire outside or build it inside? The question is, how do we want to use design to improve our results? You know, and that means, so even if you, of course, you're going you're to do both. Probably your start, if you don't have good design, you'll probably outsource. You'll probably hire somebody out or an agency, you know, 
Um, for example, Microsoft for many, many years hired frog design, those, all those windows XP and all those windows, you know, and it looks really beautiful because frog design made it really beautiful. X member XP and all these operating systems, Vista, I remember Vista, they don't even talk about Vista anymore. After one year, they stopped talking about it. They removed it from their website. It, you know, they even called Windows XP was supposed to stand for experience because they felt like it was a better experience. These are in the, the child days of, you know, when, when user experience was not fully understood as a business tool, you know, and the, so like, oh, you know, we'd make it look beautiful and then it'll be fine because it's just pretty pictures. And what Microsoft has learned so many times that you can give an agency, like a big, big design agency like Frog Design, and all these agencies, by the way, have, if you look at their offerings, if you, if you go to an interactive agency, digital agency, they'll be offering you user experience design. They might not be good at it. Like I know you guys, uh, Vivid Vibes, you specialize in this area, but if you go, there are many interactive agencies and you go to an interactive agency and you don't know, they'll say to you, yes, yeah, the experience, user experience, very important, but maybe they don't have the expertise because they're marketing and sales, digital people, they create the whole website. So they don't have that same um, level of specialization in this area. Um, so you have to hire the right outside designer, first of all, that's important. Uh, but then what do you do with it? So let's say they let's say they do a good job. They make it beautiful. They make it functional, like it works. It connects with the user. It has an emotional connection. It, they do a good job. You know, they're 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 the it was it was perfect. Then what happens? What happens with the next product, with the next service? What happens after that? And that's why I say you have to ask the question of organizationally, how do you, how do you swallow this design? How do you, do you just taste it? Is it a mezedes for you? Or is it, is it actually nourishment for your body? Do you eat it? And then you say, oh, that's really good. Okay. I'll eat it more often. We'll eat it. We'll eat it regularly. And ultimately there's some point you have to take the, the your chef, you can't just keep, you know, going and picking up fast food you have to cook at home and because, you know, at some point you have to, it's because of the cost and so forth and so on. So maybe to begin, you know, the other thing too, is I work with organizations that have UX teams, the big organizations or, you know, they have UX team. Um, and they look to my consulting firm, for example, to use it as a way to, um, like wake people up or to show credibility, you know, because um, various political factors or whatever, you know, it's easier to 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 get the the uh, recommendations from a consultant. So there's a political use of design outside from from the outside. Um, but even if you just do it inside, let's look at the other side for a moment. You're inside and you're building your team internally, and you're design. You, you know, maybe you even put a chief experience officer or, or chief customer officer, right? CCO, it's, a, it's another title, chief, uh, yeah, chief, or chief design chief. Maybe you put like a, 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 a figure, a chef at the top, right? And then uh, the, the organization continues to do the same things that they did before without thinking about the customer. And the design gets pushed over into the corner where the design doesn't have that that visibility as a business tool is not supported by the very top. It's not supported by the very bottom. The engineers are like, "Why well, enough that?" And uh, the 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 CEO is like, "The taxi, you know, or pelatis in the protos, you know, like whatever." And so there's a lip service from the you know, and there isn't the support. So that design chief and her or her his uh, group, they're isolated. They don't have the chance to make the business impact in the organization. So, you know, it depends on your company, but depends on how willing you are to invest and to see, you know, business design innovation as a, um, uh, as, as, a, as a chance to change and do this digital transformation, you know, to this digital transformation, this cultural transformation. Um, but, you know, we, we can now very easily make the business case for design. 
There are books about the return on investment of usability of user experience. There are many studies there in, in America, they've studied the, the, from the, um, the SMP, Standard and Poor, you know, uh, 500. It's like Moody's or, or you know, these ratings system. They look at the, the companies that invested in design, they found over, over 10 year period that the ones that invested in design and user experience design outperform the other by, by about 12%. Um, you know, and the other one, the ones who don't invest, who don't pay attention to this, they under, they go below. The important reason why design has taken such a prominent role, you know, is it just, you know, the creative people, um, you know, making a lot of noise and, you know, making a lot of uh, trying to get attention to, to their, uh, to their design or to, you know, is this just another fad, you know, is this a fad like in the eighties or nineties or, um, you know, what, why is design so important? Why is design something that every industry is now being touched by, you know, including the World Health Organization, trying to understand how to use design thinking. Uh, design thinking is also um, uh, the same methodology that is the ISO standard. Uh, Human-centered design is the ISO standard, what we call user-centered design, right? Um, or customer experience or user experience. I, I, ISO standard, who listens to ISO, right? No, nobody cares about ISO, but it, there is a standard and the standard is very clear that, it, you know, that design involves customers and design involves um, prototyping and design involves testing with customers, with users of that system. This is human centered. And the reason why it's so important is because we live in a digital world in a multi-channel, so-called omni-channel world, right? So we're SMS to mobile, to desktop, to an internet of things enabled experience, you know, um, to AI constantly in and around our lives um, in the background. Um, we live in a digital age and we live with technology getting into the equation everywhere that we are. And um, and then also, you know, technology is being used to improve or innovate or, you know, um, and, you know, I remember when I was visiting my uncle in, um, uh, uh, in Greca, which is, which is in the, um, just south of Patras, uh, which is where my grandmother comes from, actually, <laughs> came from. And, um, uh, they at the t this was just a few years ago, and he had a tablet. He he didn't have Wi-Fi, but he had a tablet, and the tablet was given by the European Union as part of like digital inclusion. Because the big concern over the last like 15 years or whatever up to that point was that people are being left out of digital inclusion, you know, that they're not being included. So just having the device is 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 like the definition of digital inclusion. It's not. That's not, he had the tablet, but he had no Wi-Fi. He didn't know how to use this cheap Android tablet. So, you know, now you can get the tablet for a couple hundred euros or something like that, right? A cheap Android tablet. So who cares? You know, and in Tunisia, uh, for example, I visited Tunisia a few years ago and was curious about the culture. I was doing some design, cross-cultural design research. And they told me they, you know, they had a revolution there, a successful Arab Spring as considered successful of all the Arab Spring. And they told me that th the problem is that they have internet access, but only people are using Facebook. They don't know how to do research on Google. They don't know how to use the technology. So they're just on Facebook. And as you know, Facebook is um, not healthy to democracy. <laughs> In fact, Facebook is anti-democracy. It's, it's, it's a hate in the United States, it's shown itself to be a hate-making media. You know, it creates hate and creates division and creates narrow perspectives and creates uh, antagonism and conflict. Not a good tool for democracy, but supposedly part of just like my uncle's tablet in Greca, uh, in the village, uh, he, he he has a tablet that he's not using, is not in, enabling him, it's not including him in any digital revolution by bullshit, right? So. Um, this is why design is so important, uh, user experience design, human-centered design, is because technology is only a tool 
right? It, it's only a tool and it's how the tool helps the human being, how the tool helps the human being. And this is the role of technology. It's not about the technology. It's not about having a key to a house and you don't know what to do when you go in the house. Like in Tunisia, their democracy is stuck. They got rid of the dictator, but they have the exact same problems. The, the, the change is not coming. They're very frustrated. Their connection to the outside world is, you know, that you can't, you can't give someone money in Tunisia because the banking system rules prohibit it. Uh, you know, there are so many issues. This golden, just having Facebook to organize a revolution or whatever, and, you know, didn't do anything, really. I mean, just changed a little, you know. So the reason why human-centered design, which is where UX design, user experience design comes from, is because making it relevant and appropriate to the person and to your customer, you know, aligning with what's important to them, you know, that's the important thing. So that when they get the technology, they can actually do the intention you had, which was, you know, perform this action, uh, uh, you know, complete this goal, uh, connect with this this person or make a decision in business to business, you know, uh, if you, you know, I was sitting at Goldman Sachs in New York City a few years ago doing a, some user research. And I said to the guy, what about, he was a research analyst. And I said, what about the, um, the little red, the little red check? What about the little red thing? And he said, what, what red thing? I, I don't see any red thing. And he was colorblind, about 10% of men uh, in, in the world are colorblind, like red and green. And so that's why human centered, you know, like we give him the alert. He's an important analyst in Goldman Sachs and he doesn't see that the symbol. I mean, so you can give someone technology and tools and it's just sitting there like the tablet in, in, in my, on my uncle's table it looks beautiful. And there's a nice sticker on the back says, you know, courtesy of European union, digital inclusion project, whatever, you know, um, and that's that's the thing is we're in in a situation now with uh, technology and um, and marketing and democracy and whatever it doesn't matter every single industry is touched by this issue that we need to listen to designers but specifically ex people that are designers for humans so user experience designers. It, it's more than just the pictures and it's more than just writing software. These are like engineering and art things. It's about connecting to the person, to the human or to the society, right? And so this is why uh, uh, design is being taken seriously and is as an important tool in business today. Do, do, you, do you believe that uh, customers should drive innovation uh, or when you say humans, uh, human is the epicenter of everything, how do you approach that in your mind? You know, it, it's it's important to um, look at what works and what doesn't work. And in, in business, right, it's, it's not academia. It's not a university where you can play around and you can make experiments and then go, ah, oh, you know, and then write a book about it or something like that. Um, you have to go with what works. <laughs> and there are industry standards. There, your competitors are doing this already. In Greece, your competitors in the rest of Europe um, are doing this already. You know, German companies, uh, Dutch companies, English companies, um, and of course, all the Scandinavian companies, they already, they've already been doing this now for many, many years. Um, they're very fast to understand this because the way they organize their societies is about including people in those Scandinavian countries. They're already people-centered. If you go there, you go to a Scandinavian country, you know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, or Denmark, um, you start noticing that they make decisions and just even in public about what you can do and what you can't do based on the greater good, based on, based on the other person. Um, so best practices, there's something called best practices, industry standard, things that we know work. We know that if you give technology to a human, but you don't make it fit the human and you don't subordinate it to the human's needs to the human's needs um to what the person you know so for example when you push a button you have to be able to see that it's a button you have to know that it's a button to push y you know if you don't 
allow that, if you don't facilitate that, then you're playing with fire. That's the real experiment. So if you want to experiment, do calculated experiments, do proven experiment, things that we know work. And we know that the approach to designing successful software, and I, when I say successful, I mean business results software, you know, that we can increase conversion rates in e-commerce by using uh, customer-centered or human-centered design approaches. Um, we can Im increase patient satisfaction in hospitals and in, at least in the U.S., the private healthcare system, it's all about, you know, patient satisfaction. Um, we can increase, uh, uh, you know, citizen satisfaction even in a library. You know, I've worked with many libraries trying to improve their, their website design for public services. So the same applies to products and services as well as experiences. Um, the, uh, so, so yes, following that, and then of course I mentioned ISO standard, following the, the industry standard, so following the best practices. Um, the, if you just rely on marketing, I think this is what you were saying about customer service or asking customers. If you just ask customers, if you just uh, use traditional techniques, because you're saying, why we already do this? What is he talking about? Is this just a new name or some, you know, fancy? He's just selling. He's like American guy selling his fancy stuff, you know, like. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's not that actually. It, it's it's it, it's not a new name. It's been around since the very beginning, since the late 1970s. In fact, when Apple, I mentioned Apple earlier, it, they're a nice example to look at, but when I mentioned them, they introduced this new product called a computer, personal computer. What is this? Nobody wanted that. No one, nobody wanted to pay $3,000, $5,000 for a personal computer at the end of the 1970s. Why would you do that? Uh, what can you do with it? It's ridiculous, limited, there's no mouse, You know, it's just a stupid thing. And they started doing user testing, 1978, 19, when Apple opened 1978, then 1979, they were doing usability testing with users. And they, they, didn't, they, um, they started because they had to sell the product. And this is why, you know, if you have to sell, if you have to get a human to use your app, your mobile app, or your mobile service and app, or your product, or your digital product, or whatever it is, or, or you have to get your, your um, business users to, to interact with a web application, you know, or a payroll system or whatever ERP or whatever system they're interacting with. If you have to force a human to push the button, then you have to make sure that you included the human in that. And that's the best practice. We know that that's the way that works. So do that. But don't use market research. That's from a very different. What is market research? Market research is... Um, something that was invented after World War II in the United States to sell you like um, cornflakes, to sell you uh, quacker, you know, to sell you oats, you know, to sell you products like that. They, they, they did focus groups, they did surveys, and they productized these techniques um, as a way to try and understand opinions. They did this because they were selling this like advertising, like they were trying to build desire, trying to, the consumer culture really came out of the 1930s in America, the government kind of created it. And by the night after the war, and then in the late 40s, early 1950s, they created, it was like consumer culture was like American culture. And it was the dream of, you know, like you could have material things, you know, after the war, now we can all own a car and a house and a microwave, or I'm sorry, uh, not a microwave, um, <laughs> television, uh, a toaster, you know, um, uh, a refrigerator, you know, these technologies, but you had to sell them to people who didn't want to buy them. So that's why they use market research. The problem now, and the reason we need UX and user-centered design, human-centered design, because now we give our customers digital experiences with an app, with a screen, with a computer, some technology, a touch screen, you know, McDonald's even, you go to McDonald's and you touch screen or something like that, right? Uh, and this is very different. This is, not, this is not normal for human beings. It was never the plan. The plan was never to give, you know, it, it's interesting in America, when you go to the supermarket, they use like credit cards mostly or cash. 
they don't really do mobile payment like they do in, in many countries in Europe and Asia. Um, uh, and depends country by country, but, uh, or they, you know, they don't do contactless so much. Uh, they have a little bit, but the, you do it yourself. It follows the cultural rhythm of American society. You do the credit card, you, you put the thing in. And it, sometimes they're different for each store and you feel stupid. You know, you're putting like, what, like, what, beep, oh, what, beep, beep. And the woman says, oh, try it again. Or the man says, I, I, let me do it for you. I, I noticed that in Europe generally, uh, or uh, at least in the UK, um, you know, where I've been living, they, they, um, they do it for you. You don't, they, they let, you know, they, they let, now with COVID it's changed. With COVID it's mostly contactless in the UK and like, I 99% of transactions are, are mobile pay or contactless. Um, and they don't want to touch it now because of COVID. But beforehand, before they would do it for you as a matter of politeness. Um, so, you know, when you're designing technology, you, it's very important that you align the needs of the technology, the button for the culture that you're designing for. And in the case, if you're a Greek designer designing for Greek culture or a Greek company designing for Greek consumers or citizens or whoever you know the organization is, it's important that you don't borrow the techniques from Germany or from America or from England because they will play out very differently on the street in, in Greece or in the village in Greece. You know, and, and because Greece is such a small uh, country and small society, you know, I mean, culturally, there is a shared experience that can help, but also not help. You might feel, oh, I understand Greece. Oh, yeah, I understand the village. I'm from a village. You know, my family's from, I know, I know about the islands. I'm from the islands. Um, but it's very important. It's equivalent of being from Athens and designing for um, Cyprus. Uh, Frank, uh, my question is what are success metrics of design? Because you, you, you point out so many different aspects of, uh, okay, human is at the center, but there's so many different cultural yeah. technology, ability, yeah. localized things. So what are the, would you recommend the success metrics of a good design? The success metrics of a good design, and uh, first of all, it's a good question because you should measure all success of a design it's not just about you know like oh it's a good design it looks good um, all 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 design or all user experience should be measured um, and that's an important practice to have if you're doing a rolling out a service or rolling out a product or an app or whatever it is um, the main way that we measure success in user experience the main way of when we, if we do like a user test, we have the user use it, they push the button, they look at, oh, something happens. They go, oh, what was that? And, um, is successful task completion. Successful, so can they complete the task? The, you know, the task is to push the button and open the door. Um, can they complete that without making mistakes, without being confused, without taking a long time? Can they successfully do that efficiently? You know, so that's the number one metric and then other metrics, you know, when it comes to a service, for example, how do you evaluate a new service that you roll out? For example, a new COVID friendly service, you know, hopefully we can get rid of this COVID and um, this constant state of pandemic, but there's a lot of innovation in that pandemic actually, um, because it shows you what's broken and it shows you what's weak. So for me, it's a chance to fix that, to heal that, correct that and then measure that, measure that success. And the way that usually with services, if it's, for example, a physical experience is usually doing customer satisfaction. I was just in a, um, a public toilet at um, uh, in Amsterdam at Schiphol Airport. And uh, it, I saw on the, on the bathroom mirror, it was asking for satisfaction for the cleanliness of the toilet. And it was actually forced to research that was um, collecting that data for them. It had a Forrester logo on that. Um, things so um, so it's going to depend on based on whichever experience you um, are measuring but um, uh, you know of course when it comes to e-commerce it you can you're already measuring metrics such as conversion rate that would be an important one in e-commerce um, but uh, when we when we test for usability the the main one is success or failure or partial success you know and then see how you know eight out of ten users successfully completed the task 
that means it's it's okay. There, are, you know, if only three out of ten users complete the task, there's a problem with that task. So each task, you know, maybe you test 10, 15 tasks, look at each one and see how successful it is. One of the important things with, you know, I mentioned uh, following best practices, ISO standard, you know, like uh, human-centered design, right? This is behind the whole field of UX or user experience or service design. Um, but it's important with any methodology and any advice or any recommendations that it be applied to your situation, to your context, to your country. Uh, for example, mobile payment. I talked a little bit about mobile payment just being used more so, not so much in America, even though Apple and Google created mobile payment and Google Pay, they don't use it in America. There's maybe about a 24% adoption rate with Apple Pay and like 1%, 2% with Google Pay in, in the US. Why is that? Oh, we don't have time to talk about that, but America is a cash culture, a little bit like Greece. Is like, you know, um, and different, different reasons shape it, different societal reasons and so forth. In China, for example, massive adoption with uh, mobile payment, right, with WeChat, for example. Uh, and it's their ecosystem with all sorts of other services inside of one app, in, inside of an ecosystem. And this ecosystem approach works really well in Asia, actually, uh, because their business environment is not competitive like it is in the West or in the United States. In the United States, it's so competitive that it takes many, many years to, for example, texting. We were very late to texting to SMS in the US. And the reason was because it wasn't because people were stupid and they didn't know how to text. It's because the carriers, the different companies, the phone companies, they wouldn't work with each other. They wouldn't create a standard. So, and the same thing is happening now with Google phones and Apple phones. They, if you send multimedia to a Google phone from an Apple phone, it won't go through. You have to send just text. And that's deliberate. It's not a problem. They're doing that so that they can create that tension, right? So uh, in Japan, Japan is a very cash-oriented society. And they don't, they don't trust mobile payment. But it's a high-tech society. So if you're trying to create mobile payment for Japan, you're going to fail unless you understand how to have a way that works for their culture. Even the Chinese would like to go to Japan with WeChat and give them, but they can't. It shows you this. So even China, this the reason China is very quiet with its products, you know, you don't see a lot of them, mostly just consumer things on, in Amazon in the US and around the world because the Chinese don't understand this. They've had many, many years of isolation, right? The Chinese, they only came out of their like uh, isolation in like the early 90s, really, like 80s, early 90s and early 2000s, really. It's, you know, you, maybe even 2005 is the start of, and then all of a sudden it's like Wall Street and Los Angeles in China, like boom, you know, just overnight. Um, but it doesn't mean that they can just march into Japan and give them, even though it's nearby and so forth. Um, but what does this mean for um, you? It means that any of this advice, any of the human-centered design or UX principles, they have to be specific to Greece. You can't just take a best practice that worked in London or that worked in Berlin and just assume it's gonna work in Greece. It has to be specific to Greece. Um, and, and, and the same thing goes, I think, for if you look at all the failed economic programs, largely coming from Berlin uh, to Greece, it, the reason is because the Greek people were not consulted. The, the Greek politicians were not c consulted. They were not listened to, really. It was a program of this is our design of our economic system and you will adopt it because you are part of the, the Euro community and the Euro currency. Um, and if you look at the failure of that in Greece's recent history, it's a painful, painful lesson. But for me, the lesson is make sure that the solutions, the design solutions, the innovations that you make 
are from the Greek community, for the Greek community, made in Greece, designed in Greece, because um, for too many years, Greece has been adopting and you know, eating the innovations and the innovation direction or innovation leadership from outside. And it's time for Greece to go back 2,000 years to the innovations of, you know, giving us democracy and giving us the language and giving us, you know, advanced science, um, you know, and, 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 but, but to do that for Greece first, to do that for Greece first. So that's my, that's my, uh, uh, my hope for, for Greece is we need to turn around the direction of where we're taking um, guidance from, you know, and we need to start from the inside, from uh, Greece itself. Yeah, the same, the same uh, um, advice goes for, for everybody right now, especially because we have to pay attention. So we have to pay attention to, like, don't design from two years ago. Don't design from five years ago. I and mean, there's a lot of things to learn in the past. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's a lot of, you know, beautiful things. But pay attention right now to the, the world is changing so fast and is going to be changing so fast. For example, um, if you're designing clothes, um, the great fashion designers of the 1960s were designing clothes and just putting them all over the world, these disposable fashions. Well, you can't do that now. You have to think about the environment. You have to think about sustainability. Uh, you know, even if you don't care about sustainability, because you're like, ah, you know, yeah, we recycle and you know, we have to worry about the humans, not the, not the environment, you know, we, it's maybe, maybe you're still not fully on board with um, the needs of sustainability. The community that you work with in the European Union, maybe the grant funding or the collaboration, it's going to have that important criteria in it. Um, so what does that look like for Greece? What does sustainable tourism look like? What does sustainable products? Why is it that in Germany, they make all of their own products? If you go to Germany, it's amazing. You, everything is made in Germany. I can't believe it. In, in America, everything is made in China. Very few things are made in America in America. Um, so, you know, that's a business sustainability to make your own products, but then also to think about the, the environment. The most important thing for Greek designers and for Greek businesses is, is to um, listen to your customers, to conduct customer research. And I mean behavioral research, UX, with a UX research, uh, you know, how do I push the button? How do I, do I need an app? Oh, let me give you an app. Here's an app to change your life. I'm going to get you digital now. Here's an app. Do I need an app? Why are you giving me an app? What is the app doing? Is the app comfortable for that user? Do the, does the user use other apps? You know, you need to understand the behavioral um, uh, uh, flexibility or the behavioral range of opportunity that you can design solutions for. Uh, when we look at service design, for example, I know it's a, an area that you guys work in. Uh, we don't come up with a solution in the beginning. We go and to the streets. We go and listen to what the conditions are, what, what are the change attitudes in Greece? Greece, is, Greece has been changed dramatically from three rounds of austerity, for three, four rounds uh, of austerity. Greece has been changed, or attitudes have changed. Um, you know, so knowing what those things are, it, 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 you know, it is very important. Know your users, uh, listen to your users, design with your users and the communities that you're impacting, right? As a, in, in the United States right now, for example, if you came and tried to design for the United States, but you didn't understand that in 2020, there was a huge shift, a huge concern for um, you know, communities that have been left out of design process you know, because we've had the second civil rights movement, you know, racial tension, for example, um, you, would, you would be failed. I, I don't know how many times, like I have, I'm working on a project now they, the client said, can we have more pictures of people of color, you know, black people and Asian and Latinx people in the, in the, in the imagery? It already was there, but there's a sensitivity. I just attended a, a, a discussion yesterday and they said, well, what about, you know, um, uh, you know, do we, do we have, you know, this looks like it's maybe can only, this experience is only for girls. 
what about for boys, you know, and it's, so that, or, or what about for boys who identify as boys, you know, so this, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, gender binary or fluid identity, right? Um, you know, what does your, what does your experience look like for someone who's, who's uh, LGBTQ, you know, or transgender, you know, what is that experience for? Because even it, uh, like three years ago in the United States, the healthcare companies started to change their policies. The prisons are changing their policies for transgender support. So the rights of transgender people are becoming more democratized. You know, what does that community, what do they need, you know? Um, even just putting on a form, you know, man, woman, it's not a good practice. The good practice now is to allow for, you know, uh, uh, for, the, for the other category that someone might want to put or leave empty or not say, you know, if you ask someone what their age is or what their income is, you know, you're changing the conversation. So you have to, you have to check in and you have to do user testing. It's not enough to just create beautiful designs. You have to talk to people and you can do this online with COVID. You know, we're doing um, almost all of our research online. Um, we're using diary studies as is a technique that we can um, ask users to keep a diary for a couple of weeks. And we, we do, we mix that with interviews. We capture, um, you know, uh, things in their life, things that they're dealing with issues, concerns, or, or, or artifacts that, that are significant to them, you know, so that we understand their world and what's important to them. And that's the most important part in all UX design. I'll say it again. The most important part in all UX design for UX designers, especially in Greece, is to uh, connect with your users, include them, bring them in, check out participatory design. It's a Scandinavian technique, but it's a good way to uh, what we call community centered so that you're just listening to the needs of that community you're designing for and bringing that into the design process uh, and then go back out and test again to, to verify. Uh, verify, validate, listen, the empathy that you get from that process and then make sure you measure it. Show the business results. Don't just do good UX, show the business results. Measure it and bring that um, business uh, discipline to your design process. Uh, be flexible as a designer. Don't just be a designer. Don't just expect the rest of the company to get excited about design. Be careful how you communicate uh, about this stuff with other stakeholders who don't believe it or don't care about it or they're not familiar with it. Help them become familiar. Show them, teach them, bring them the data from the outside from your customers. Show them that this approach um, uh, how this works, because there's an international community of best practice around this you can tap into, but it has to feel Greek, it has to be Greek, and it has to be um, designed in Greece by, Greek, by Greeks. I think that's, to me, the key um, as a way to get success at the cultural level at the, and at the country level. And, um, and it's the same thing if you're Greek and you're designing for Turkey or for Bulgaria or for Germany, France, you know, Spain, Italy. Uh, even Italy, you think, oh, well, we're similar, you know, Italy, Greek, but um, Italy is so different from Greece. You know, even North Italy and South Italy are very different culturally. So you have to, you have to understand that. You have to, you know, hopefully you can travel and do research. If not, you can do online research to find that out. But that's, that's the key thing.